я предоставляю слово ведущему первого заседания моей коллеге, профессору Екатерине Анатольевне Лютиковой, которая представит профессора Томаса Ринета, нашего предоставленного докладчика. And I am happy to introduce our first invited speaker, Professor Thomas Riyad from the Stockholm University. Professor Riyad is a first level specialist in phonology, prosody and political media, as well as in historical linguistics, especially in Germanic language. Thomas received his PhD from the Stockholm University in 1992. His thesis Structures in Germanic prosody and iconic study with special reference to the Nordic languages concerns the historical development of the North Germanic stress systems. Thomas Rath occupied guest researcher positions at Stanford University, Vilnius University, and University Paris in Sandy. Uh, he was awarded several academic prizes and was elected to the Swedish Academy in 2011. His most prominent piece of research is his volume entitled The Phonology of Swedish in the Oxford University Press's extensive series The Phonology of the World's Languages. Thomas Rath's latest project is the prosodic hierarchy of Swedish where he aims at identifying and determining the various categories in the prosodic hierarchy of Swedish. He has also worked a lot on the interface between morphology and prosody, which is his topic at this conference, and to show how the shape of Swedish word forms is constrained in non trivial ways by the prosodic property. So I'm glad to meet Professor Thomas Riyad and look forward to hearing his talk, the interface between prosody and morphosynthesis in Swedish. Please. Thank you very much. Standing over here because uh, the screens are different, uh, which make uh, Swedish or Norwegian uh, interesting to look at from this very perspective. Because um, so uh, we have a restricted stress system, uh, which is more restricted than in the other Germanic languages. One could say it's defective. Uh, we have fewer stresses, is, is a way of putting it, than uh, English, for instance. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, a tonal uh, uh, accent distinction, uh, which also behaves uh, different. Well, the very presence of the tonal accent distinction is one big difference, uh, but also the way uh, tonal accents or pitch accents signal prominence is different in Swedish from, from English. And I'll try to show that uh, today and how we can learn things about uh, uh, primarily about the prosodic word, or, so the prosodic shape that interfaces with uh, morphology and syntax. Uh, so here are, uh, we know that pro uh, prosody uh, constrains um, uh, morphology in, in certain ways, at least in Germanic. We have this, uh, there is a certain selection of um, uh, derivational suffixes that has to do with the prosodic shape. So a, a heavy suffix can't go after any other uh, uh, any shape of the root. Uh, and then of course there are the famous cases of the root and pattern um, uh, morphology of, of you know, Arabic and Berber. Uh, nickname formations and reduplications. Those are morphological uh, uh, those are that's morphology, right? Which is uh, defined by prosodic uh, properties. Uh, on the other hand, we also have uh, uh, we have the alignment of morphology and syntax with prosody, uh, which happens in, in all languages, obviously. So, uh, students of, of morphology and, and syntax, they have their own theory, their own uh, trees, but those trees have to be matched uh, with uh, a prosodic tree in order to be uh, uh, pronounced. Right? But this alignment is not perfect, so you can't say I have an NP in my, uh, in my syntax, and that's going to have a, a, a predictable prosodic shape, but that there will be mismatches. There will be an overall uh, good match, but there will also be uh, imperfections, and that's where we can learn stuff. And that tells us that 
He tells us that more prosody and, and morphology and morphosyntax are separate, obviously, uh, but it also is a, is a place to study the properties of the prosodic hierarchy uh, and the way that uh, uh, constraints uh, morphology. So we look at uh, uh, we look at the cases where the grouping, the prosodic grouping, differs from the morphosyntactic uh, grouping. Uh, and today I'll, I'll um, uh, we'll take a brief look at the prosodic hierarchy first, and then uh, the kinds of indications uh, for prosodic categories that you can find. Its prominences are boundaries, so it's it's domains, right? And to find uh, uh, the edges of domains, you might look for boundary signals, uh, prosodic boundary signals like tones. Uh, or you can look, and then you have to look for headedness of those categories, and that's going to be prominences. Uh, and I, uh, I've marked the word prominence blue here because that's uh, what I'll talk most of about. Okay, and then we have the pitch accent and lexical tones uh, in uh, Swedish, uh, and how they can be key to understanding uh, the prosodic structure of the of words in Swedish via the alignment of uh, morphology uh, with morphology and syntax. And if there is time, I'll talk a little about the higher uh, uh, higher categories like the prosodic phrase and the uh, intonation phrase. But mostly, I think I'll be talking about the the, the word uh, prosodic word. So here's a typical picture of the prosodic hierarchy. These are the categories at the top. We have the utterance, the intonation phrase, the prosodic phrase, the prosodic word, and then below uh, the prosodic word, you have uh, what's called rhythmic domains that don't really interface directly with uh, morphology, foot syllable, and mora. People, uh, not everybody agrees with this uh, uh, prosodic hierarchy. I think even I don't agree with it, but this is a standard type of uh, 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 picture of the prosodic hierarchy. So the first thing to recognize is that prosodic structure is flatter than syntax. So uh, syntax, as you know, contains uh, a lot of embedding, uh, uh, where prosody doesn't uh, in the same way. So uh, if you write a, uh, if you draw a syntactic tree, it's going to look. Uh, you know, something like this, and everything is going to be embedded, or it's going to be sort of uh, hierarchically embedded uh, uh, categories under another. Uh, whereas syntax, uh, prosody is not like that, right? Prosody is flat; it just groups things and put them next to each other. So uh, already from this, uh, you know, uh, trivial fact, uh, it follows that there will be mismatches. You know, prosody is not going to be a perfect reflection of, of syntax. Uh, the role of prosody is uh, is not to express the syntax exactly, but it's mostly to uh, uh, you know to make the syntax interpretable, indicate where the important boundaries are, uh, and also signal information structure. I'm sure there are other things for you to do. So the non-isomorphism between prosody and syntax is easily demonstrated by an example like this. So she learned her roller blades to Robin is going to have one syntactic structure. Uh, but at least uh, three different pos possible uh, prosodic uh, uh, phrasing uh, alternatives. So you can make it all into one prosodic phrase. Uh, I guess you'd say she loaned her rollerblades to Robin. Uh, or you could say she loaned her rollerblades to Robin. And that's going to be a different, uh, it's going to have different uh, pragmatic uh, interpretation, but, uh, but not a different syntactic structure. And then, of course, you can have uh, emphatic stress on, on the verb, and, and you'd say she loaned the role of legs to Robin. And then uh, you have three uh, prosodic phrases for the same syntactic uh, structure. What you can't do in English is to go, she loaned her role of legs to Robin. That's apparently <coughs> ungrammatical. So, uh, the way we describe the prosodic, uh, uh, or yeah, the prosodic structure uh, is with the, these kinds of uh, notions. Uh, so these would be, um, these be in an opt optimality theory, these would be constraints. Uh, but it's things like uh, no pro uh, layeredness, which says that no prosodic phrase dominates an intonation phrase. So the intonation phrase is higher up, and you can't dominate that. I'm sure there are uh, things that correspond to that in, in syntax. Non-recursivity, no prosodic word dominates a prosodic word. That would also be a, a constraint, but it's obviously something uh, that's not always true, as we'll see in a minute. 
Headedness, a prosodic phrase, must dominate a prosodic word, which means that you have to have a, your head in the next lower uh, category in the, uh, uh, in the prosodic hierarchy. And exhaustivity, that everything, uh, everything at a given level uh, uh, is uh, uh, passed into the next higher level, so you don't leave any stray, stray elements. Okay, but recursivity is uh, is uh, obviously not going to be um, no. There's going to be recursivity. So even if you don't want to have this uh, one one category dominates uh, itself, uh, uh, there is plenty of evidence for that. So here are a few cases. The first one from German. So it's Sparlampe uh, that contains two root morphemes, and each root morpheme uh, in this case forms a prosodic word. Now you make a compound, now you have two prosodic words together and they are supposed to form another word and that's going to be uh, a higher level than uh, or Energiesparlampe so that's three minimal prosodic words dominated by a bigger one In the uh, fra cases of uh, phrases you have uh, uh, sort of coordinate, coordination structures like uh, uh, Arthur or Mehmet and Mary and Stephanie so to get those uh, to make uh, an interpretation of those, you have to have uh, uh, several prosodic phrases. You have to phrase uh, uh, each element here. Or author has to be one phrase, maybe another, and then they should be grouped. Uh, and then they are conjoined with Mary and Stephanie, which is the third prosodic phrase here. And then everything is a prosodic phrase. So and this is done uh, by prosodic means, right? So by, by boundary marking or by, by uh, accent. Uh, placement, the prominence placement. And uh, here's a complex case for the intonation phrase. The, the woman that the man that Leila loves needs today has a dog. So that's, uh, that's uh, 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 an intonation phrase that contains other intonation phrases. So this happens. Uh, but it has to be constrained somehow. So in a fairly recent proposal by Ito and Bester, uh, uh, so up till their research, there had been several uh, uh, proposals for what the prosodic hierar hierarchy looks like, and there still is. But um, they try to constrain, uh, constrain the very, you know, if this is, uh, if grammar is universal, or if we at least look for universals in grammar, uh, we should also constrain the way we use the prosodic hierarchy for different languages. Try to come up with one basic theory for it. And that proposal is uh, that uh, there is a, a few categories in universally in um, in the prosodic hierarchy, uh, but that each uh, each category can be recursive, can contain itself. That's the way to deal with uh, the variation in uh, in in languages. So the idea is that you have one prosodic category, like the prosodic word. That's uh, so you can have rules that talk about the prosodic word. But then the prosodic word can also contain uh, a minimal projection and a maximal projection, like two levels, and there could be stuff in between, that could be uh, uh, categories in between. Uh, and rules can uh, then refer to the minimal, minimal projection or the maximal projection, or just the category as such. And that gives some rich, richness to the, uh, to the model. So then we can reduce uh, uh, the first picture to these, uh, these things, in fact, we should get rid of uh, the utterance. So we just have the intonation phrase, the prosodic phrase, and the prosodic word uh, as interface to morphous syntax. And instead, we can allow uh, uh, we, we can allow uh, some uh, uh, recursion. So this is what recursion is supposed to look like. So here we have uh, at the very top is the intonation phrase. At the bottom is the prosodic word, and this uh, example shows you schematically what the prosodic phrase would look like. There would be a minimal projection down here, uh, and then you can adjoin stuff uh, over here. You can sort of uh, expand your, uh, uh, your word uh, with uh, additional material, and we'll look at examples of that, and then you arrive at the maximal projection, which is going to be the, the word. So it's going to be sort of the word that you send to syntax, that occurs in syntax. That's going to be the maximal projection. Uh, often it's just going to, oh sorry, the, the phrase in this case. So often there's not going to be a difference between the minimal and maximal 
uh, projection. It's only when it's more complex. So here is the, uh, the word. It has sort of the same basic structure. You have uh, a minimal projection, a maximal projection, uh, and you need the maximal projection specifically for when you have stuff uh, adjoined. Okay, so that's sort of the ramifications, uh, and we'll now turn to the uh, example. Uh, we look at uh, Central Swedish, which has these uh, prosodic properties. It's, it's a stressed language, so syllables are stressed or unstressed. Uh, it has uh, pitch prominence uh, at two levels, which are called uh, big accents and small accents. So this means uh, uh, we use tonal means to, uh, like I'm, I, I'm sure you do in Russian too, you add, uh, you add uh, on top of stress, you can add a pitch, uh, a pitch event, and that's going to give increased prominence to this, uh, uh, to this word. Uh, and that pitch prominent, prominence comes in two types. The small type, uh, which is going to be a little less prominent than the big type, which is going to be things like focus. Uh, Okay, so that's just the intonation. But then we have, uh, uh, to make things uh, a bit more complex and more interesting maybe, we also have a lexical tone, uh, tone contrast, which is uh, separate from, from the, uh, the prominence as such. Uh, so within each level of, prom of tonal prominence, the small and the big, we have a contrast between what's called accent one and accent two. Right, so and that's, that's a lexical contrast. Uh, and I'll talk a little about, about that because that's sort of one of the major sources for information on, on what the prosodic structure looks like in the screen. Right, so these things are, are going to help. So let's begin with stress. Uh, so uh, uh, stress, uh, every minimal prosodic word, every ordinary simplex word will contain one stress. Uh, in Swedish, and that's different from English and German, uh, where you can have several stresses within a simplex word. Uh, and this, this could be uh, interpreted as the culminativity of the minimal prosodic word. Uh, so we would be in, in, a, in a projection of the prosodic word like this, uh, looking at the minimal prosodic word, there should be one, uh, one stress in there. So every if you look at these examples, uh, electrifiera, epidemi, blues, klematis, melodramina, words long and short, uh, as long as they are uh, simple words, they only contain uh, one stress. If you go to, to English, uh, uh, a word like uh, secretary, at least with American English uh, pronunciation, it contains two feet or two stresses, secretary or Chinese, that's two feet, two feet, two stresses. For German, militarisieren, if I exaggerate a little. Turn to the Swedish uh, 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 corresponding forms, the cognates, it's sekretierare and chinesis, militarisiera, with only one, one stress in it. So uh, this seems to, uh, so this means that uh, Swedish uh, has a defective, so to speak, a defective stress, stress structure. We only have one stress per uh, minimal word. So, so far I've only told you this, but there's actually some evidence uh, too. So there is no, uh, 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 the rhythm rule inside words uh, doesn't work in Swedish. So in English, the rhythm rule that makes things like, you have Javanese uh, with final stress and beer, uh, when you pronounce that as a phrase, it comes out as Javanese beer or Chinese beer. You move, uh, you move the stress uh, to the first syllable, and in fact, that means that the first syllable contains a foot or is part of a foot. In Swedish, you can't do that, so it's Javanese beer, Cubans back. You can't go Javanese beer or Cubans back. That's just stupid in Swedish, right? So you can't do that. And it means, uh, it means that there is a foot here, but there is no foot here. There is no secondary stress over here in speech, but there is in English. Okay, uh, so at this point it's important that you just believe that there is only one stress for every minimal, <laughs> minimal result work. Okay, and so let's now uh, uh, turn to the pitch prominence, the next level up. 
uh, and we, uh, as I said, we have two prominence levels, which are called the big uh, and the small. And those terms are just instead of the terms focal accent or word accent. Uh, uh, and the reason, the reason for this is that there is a, so while there is a strong correlation between information structural focus and big accent, it doesn't work the other way around. It's, there is not a correlation between uh, big accent and focus. Right? So for every focus, you will typically find, uh, you know, whenever, whenever you can identify an informational structural focus, you'll find a big accent, uh, pretty much all the time. But uh, when you look at big accents, not all uh, stuff that they dominate are going to be uh, focuses. So it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, come back to that. Uh, it's also important uh, to notice uh, the categorical distinction, right? So if you look at uh, pitch prominence in English, uh, it's typically going to be one, one prominence which is uh, smaller or bigger, but only by phonetic scaling, right? So it's, uh, uh, when, you, when you look at, look at this in Swedish, there are actually two different, uh, two different melodies for the small accent and the big accent. Whereas in English, it, it will be the same melody, but it will be differently scaled uh, uh, phonetically, and that's, uh, that's kind of crucial, uh, too. Okay, that's the pitch accent. I'm going to put this together in a picture in a, in a second, but I should also mention uh, the tonal distinction that we have. So, uh, we have this difference between accent 1 and accent 2, or tone 1 and tone 2, where accent 2 is marked, and accent 1 is just uh, intonation. Uh, okay, I'm going to show, show the picture that, that puts uh, this information together. So, uh, here we have, um, uh, these are the two prominence levels. These, these will be the, the small accent down here, and that's the big accent. And as you can see, uh, the melodies are completely different. Uh, these are the ones to compare. Melodies for a small accent the big accent are, are completely different. They have different phonological structure. And then, Within uh, the small accent, there would be a contrast between, okay, this L should be up here, a contrast between what's called accent one and accent two, uh, and the difference is, uh, uh, you know, where the star is, which, which tone is aligned to the stress syllable. So in accent one, it's the low tone, which is over here, so this is where the stress will be. Uh, in accent two, it's the high tone, so this is where the stress will be. It's even clearer when you look at the big accent. Big accent one has a, uh, a low, low tone uh, in the stressed syllable followed, followed by the high, syllable, the high tone, which can still be in the same syllable, but it sort of floats later. In accent two, there is a, an extra tone in the beginning here. That's, that's actually the lexical distinction here, which goes in the stressed syllable. Uh, and then you get the low high, uh, which is the same low high as over here. So, low high is intonation, and low high is intonation, and that's lexical. That's a lexical tone, there, the high tone. Okay, so, uh, so there's sort of a lot to, to keep in your head, but there is the distinction, which is in this direction, the prominence distinction, which is in the other direction. Uh, over here, I have put the compounds. So compounds get uh, accent two by uh, a regular rule. Our <coughs> compound rule is to assign accent two. Uh, in a slightly different manner, it has two, two tones associated to the first stress syllable and the last stress syllable, but it's the same melody as, in, as over here. So the alignment is a little different, but it's the same melody. And this one is exactly the same as in, in simplex. Okay, so uh, let's now look at the top level. Uh, so I said for the minimal prosodic word that they each contain one stress. And for the maximal prosodic word, uh, the proposal is that every maximal projection contains uh, a tone accent or a pitch accent. That's where the pitch accent goes, and so the culminativity of the maximal prosodic word is tonal uh, in Swedish. So in simplex words, there will be no, no distinction, right? It's going to be the same. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, so if the maximal prosodic word has one tone accent, uh, to establish that fact, uh, we have to look at uh, cases where, 
where we have morphologically uh, complex forms, where we have a clear difference between the minimal prosodic word and the maximal uh, prosodic word. And here is an example of that. So we have a, a compound here, Riyamata, the long pile drive, uh, which contains then uh, two minimal prosodic words, and uh, which are joined together as a maximal prosodic word. And uh, there, is only go there is only one accent, one pitch accent for this uh, compound. And in fact, if you make a really long uh, compound like this, uh, uh, which contains one, two, three, four, five minimal prosodic words, so five stresses, it's still just one, one uh, tonal accent, five stresses by one tonal accent. And this tells us that uh, 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 the accentual unit, the unit that receives pitch accent is the maximal prosodic word, uh, whereas the unit that con uh, receives stress or contains one stress is the minimal prosodic unit, and thereby we have a distinction between uh, the two. Let's listen to this for some words here. Thanks, I'm expecting. Two times I'm expecting. So the first, the high tone of the compound group goes with the first stress, and then nothing happens, and you get to the last stress. You associate the low tone and then you get the, the second peak, so high, low, high, and then there's a boundary tone at the end. So that's an accent uh, two. And this is the shape of uh, 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 compounds in, in uh, uh, central Swedish. Okay, so we have this distinction, stress is one stress per minimal prosodic word and one accent for this. So I'd like to uh, now turn back to uh, the minimal prosodic word and see what else uh, defines it. So I've only said so far that there is uh, a stress in each minimal prosodic word. Uh, there are also, uh, the second argument here, there is also segment distributions, things like aspiration, and rhythmic grouping, uh, uh, you know, where, uh, where you find uh, uh, H, for instance, uh, ha, uh, is only in the beginning. Uh, of a minimal prosodic word or in the beginning of the stress. Uh, but I look uh, a bit more at the, the third and fourth arguments here, namely that uh, the minimal word is the domain for syllabification in Swedish, uh, and that lexical accent can only be assigned, uh, assigned inside. So here's the way of, uh, uh, of showing this. So we have what's called the onset uh, challenge. So the onset principle says that every syllable should begin with the consonant, right? Uh, but uh, if uh, if um, uh, if the minimal prosodic word is the syllabification domain, uh, it should not. Uh, so then, we should have the onset rule should work inside the prosodic word, the minimal prosodic word, but not uh, across prosodic words, and that's true. So here uh, we have this form Harimanda uh, imitating. So it's uh, morphologically complex, as you can see. Harim is the root, and Anda is a uh, uh, present uh, participle ending. And uh, syllabification is uh, perfect inside, so that's what this means. The dots here are the, the uh, syllable boundaries, right? Harimanda. So the last M of the root goes to the uh, ending. If you make a compound, her, opa, copycat, then uh, uh, you can't do this syllabification. You don't go her, ma, ba. That's uh, unintuitive. Instead, you go her, a, ba uh, in the syllabification. And so it means that, so there's a uh, uh, prosodic boundary here. That's a minimal prosodic word, and that's another minimal prosodic word. And there's no syllabification across it. So that shows you that. Uh, syllabification uh, takes place inside. Uh, so unstressed suffixes uh, are all incorporated into the minimal prosodic word. Uh, if the stress is further to the right, that's fine too. Natural, natural, naturalist, naturalisera, they're all minimal prosodic words. But here's an uh, interesting case where uh, we also get uh, incorporation of uh, uh, um, uh, of uh, pronominal objects into uh, the minimal prosodic word. So here is uh, the example. Hon gav honom allas euros. Hon, uh, she gave him everybody's euros. Uh, 
where uh, uh, if you just pronounce every word uh, uh, separately, you get gav, honom, alas, evro. Uh, but uh, more normally, you would say gav, honom, alas, evro. Or gav, henne, gave her, gav, venne. So the uh, age is dropped and the whole thing is turned into one syllabification domain, indicating that uh, uh, the minimal word actually includes uh, uh, both the verb and the pronoun uh, in this case. <clears throat> so the evidence for this is, uh, it's, well, it's uh, my intuitions or people's intuitions that this is the simplification. But you can also look at the distribution of, of H in Swedish. So you only get H in uh, foot initial, so in the beginning of a stress syllable, or in the beginning of the uh, minimal episodic word or maximal. So uh, in the case of govene, you lose the H, which means it can no longer be in the beginning of a prosodic word, it can't be in the beginning of a stress syllable. Uh, and that's uh, the indication that this is uh, resyllabified. So this is our first uh, prosody syntax mismatch in the case of Swedish here. Uh, so sequences of syntactic words can indeed be grouped into a single minimal prosodic word. So there should only be one stress, of course, that's the conditional minimal prosodic word. It should be the same. Uh, uh, syllabification domain, and, and that's what we have here. So, another property of the minimal prosodic word is uh, lexical accent assignment. So, I've said that the pitch accent goes with a, a maximal, uh, uh, maximal prosodic word. That just means that that's the, the culminative property of the maximal prosodic word. Uh, uh, but now we're looking at the case uh, for the, the, uh, the lexical tone, the tones that are uh, memorized with some words. Those are only assigned uh, inside the minimal prosodic word. Uh, okay, let's see if I can make that, uh, that clear. So, so we want to make a distinction here between lexical tone and post-lexical tone. So lexical tone, that's accent two, as I said, uh, but it's only accent two in uh, uh, it's only accent two in simplex forms. When you look at a compound, then that's actually a phonological rule. The compound also gets accent two, but that's post-lexical accent two. Uh, so that's our compound rule. So any structure that contains more than one stress is going to get accent two by this uh, this rule. And any structure that uh, doesn't have tone and which contains one stress will get accent one. That's the, uh, the distinction. So, uh, okay, let me just jump that. So, uh, to make this a bit more, more clear, uh, yeah, please look at this picture. So, accent, lexical accent two is assigned from uh, uh, suffixes. So we have a number of suffixes here, uh, which are also uh, postphonic. They like to be next to a stressed syllable, which induce lexical accent to in Swedish. So lig, ig, ig, lig, arre, else, e, a, ar, or, ni, nad, etc. I'm sure you, if you know uh, any Germanic language, you'll recognize these endings as, as ich, lich, for instance, right? Or ich, lich. Uh, they occur in, in most uh, Germanic languages. In Swedish, they bring a tone, right? So it's a suffix, and then they contain a tone which they assign uh, to a stressed syllable. So that's what's illustrated here. Trieb uh, lig, comes with accent two, that's what the, the lexical property is, the lower two here, and then it's assigned to the stressed syllable, and the whole word gets uh, accent two. Trieb lig, nunna, nunnur, ruvelse, that's what it sounds like. Uh, but it only happens uh, if it's local, right? So no, 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 no is fine, but if you say opera, you have the same ending with accent two here, uh, it will not be able to assign accent two, and the, the thing will come out uh, with accent one, which is default for any form that has only one stress. Opera, opera. So it's the same, su same suffixes, but it's only assigned uh, if local, if it's local. Here's another case where you have a, a monosyllabic form. Monosyllables always get accent one. Uh, 
but if you add a suffix that contains accent 2, then uh, you can assign that to the whole form and it comes out as bila. But if, the, if it's non local, uh, if the suffix is not next to the stress syllable, it comes out as cactus with accent 1. Okay, so the uh, proposal that is that the lexical tone actually resides in some suffixes. Actually, that's the most common case for accent 2 in Swedish. Uh, but there are also some, some roots that are, have accent too. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm now going to, to try to show this, that lexical accent is only ever assigned inside the minimal prosodic word. If you, if you uh, go beyond the minimal prosodic word, then the post-lexical mechanisms will kick in. So to see this, let's look at uh, morphologically complex forms. Uh, uh, which are going to be these cases where you have an unstressed uh, prefix uh, it's be and fö uh, as in German, right? be und fö they are, or fed. They are uh, uh, so common Germanic but the interesting thing about them is that they uh, uh, they correlate with accent 1 when, when they, uh, we might expect accent 2 so we have cases with the unstressed prefix and we have compounds. Those are the two cases we'll look at for post-lexical accent assignment. Uh, and uh, one stress will give accent one and two stresses will give accent two in the post-lexical domain. So these prefixes, the cool thing about them is that they seem to change the accent. So here are uh, the simplex forms, föra uh, and reda, meaning lead and prepare. So the suffix comes with accent 2 and the whole form gets accent 2. Uh, but when you put a prefix uh, before it, like forfora, which means uh, seduce, so lead in a bad way, I guess, or reda, beredning, uh, uh, accent 2 is no longer a sign and instead the form gets accent 1, which is default. Forförare, beredare. So what could be the... Uh, uh, what could be the explanation for this? And of course the proposal is going to be that uh, this is a more complex structure. It's no longer, uh, accent is no longer assigned inside the minimal prosodic word, which is just this thing here. But the whole, uh, the whole structure is more complex and gets the post-lexical uh, accent assignment. So we can now derive the behavior uh, from the structural configuration. So, uh, even though there is lexical accent 2 information in the form, in the suffix, it can't be assigned because it's not, it's not the minimal prosodic word anymore that is expressed. It's a, a bigger thing, a complex uh, prosodic word. So here's the structure that, that does this. So för anledning is fine with accent 2 as long as it's just the minimal prosodic word. But now you join these uh, prefixes here uh, and we get the complex structure, obviously a, a maximal prosodic word, uh, and then uh, the post-lexical accent uh, assignment kicks in. There's only one stress, so it gets accent one. So the lexical accent information is no longer visible in the more complex structure. That's the, the argument. So, uh, so far, uh, I've just used this uh, circularly in a sense, right? Of, uh, I've assumed that this is the structure because uh, accent uh, uh, 2 is not assigned, instead it gets default. But there's actually some other, there's actually also uh, the syllabification uh, evidence again. So uh, if, uh, if, um, if this was just one big uh, minimal prosodic word domain, we would expect everything to be co-syllabified, right? We would expect this syllabification. Fö, ra, ra. The prefix fö, ä, ra. But you, if it were just one domain, it would be fö, ra, ra. And that's not the <coughs> intuition. Instead, the intuition is fö, ä, ra for the syllabification. So this indicates uh, by uh, you know, intuitive argument that uh, there is a boundary. There is a boundary between the prefix uh, and, the, and the root, uh, which uh, uh, we can diagnose by looking at the, at the uh, syllabification. So it looks like those prefixes are uh, uh, not only morphologically uh, prefixes or proclitic, but they are actually also prosodically proclitic. Right? They are not incorporated, not like suffixes. 
So this uh, this adjunction behavior is is uh, is a property of B and F, but not of other uh, prefixes like like des or com, which uh, which uh, uh, are included in the prosodic uh, in the minimal prosodic work. So kontierar desintegrera. Here the here the intuition is really that the s goes with the beginning of the root desintegrera. No problem. For the simplification. Okay, and here's another uh, piece of evidence for this, uh, uh, which is another mismatch actually with uh, syntax. So uh, we've talked about the prefixes be and for, but there's also a prefix, uh, 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 um, an adverbial for, which means too, too much. So. Uh, which will form the same type of structure. So here's a minimal, uh, minimal pair, roast beef and salmon. That's too many de delicacies. Versus uh, beef and salmon. So, uh, beef and salmon. That is uh, delicacies for many uh, people. So the crucial part here is for monga. This is uh, the preposition for many, and this is the uh, adverbial to many. So when we say too many, it comes out as fomonga with accent one, even though the form monga should have accent two. Fomonga. So this indic whereas if it's the pre uh, preposition, it comes out with accent two. Fomonga. So in this case, a uh, prosodic phrase is formed. It's not a prosodic word, but uh, up here in, in uh, too many we get a prosodic word because we get exactly the same behavior as with the uh, prefix in the uh, in the morphology. So. This is the contrast then. Here is a, a prosodic phrase, thermonga, postianen, and here is a, a prosodic word, thermonga, felita, uh, in the syntax. So this is our second prosody syntax mismatch, where an adverbial uh, and an uh, adjective can be grouped together into a single maximal prosodic word uh, by a junction, even though it's uh, you know, syntactically uh, separate. Okay, let's turn to the other case. Uh, so we looked at the junction, let's now look at compounding. Uh, so the compound rule, okay. Uh, the compound rule, I can talk for another time, right? I can talk for another time, cool. Okay, so uh, uh, the compound rule is entirely prosodic, so any, any structure containing uh, two stresses uh, will be, uh, uh, will get accent two. It doesn't matter what the lexical information is. So you take the first case here, Sommar Klenning. Sommar has accent two, Klenning has accent two. When you put them together, the whole thing gets accent two as a compound. But if you take two words that have no accent in them, Bor and Shun, uh, together they will come out with accent two. Bor, Shun, with. Uh, so um, so um, compound accent doesn't look at lexical information uh, either. So, uh, so this is the other case. So neither the uh, right. So neither the prefix forms nor compounds uh, look at lexical information, but uh, accent is assigned separately. But they differ in number of stresses, and so we get this uh, distinction between uh, accent uh, one and accent two, simply uh, according to the number of stresses. Okay, so we look at those. Okay, so. Just like with uh, prefix forms, we also get compounds in the syntax. So not real compounds, but uh, prosodic compounds in the syntax. And that's the next uh, case that we're going to look at. So here are a few cases uh, from East Norwegian and North Swedish. Uh, these are uh, uh, phrasal... Oh, there are no translations here. Here's a... Uh, let's look at North Swedish. I'm going to wrap it for you. So this is a, a so-called particle word, verb, slow in, uh, or shika uh, ot, or for ut, uh, get out. Uh, but they can be uh, uh, prosodified as compound structures. So you go, jaska slå in an or jaska shikko den, få ut den, with accent two. As we're going to listen to an example of this. So in this example from uh, Northern Swedish, uh, here's a real compound, pankakur, 
pancakes, Dini, and here is uh, a compound uh, made in the syntax, so this has come up, uh, but it's still, so they have the same prosody, and try to listen for this. <coughs> So listen for comma and do it again. Finns på mera med kommet att ha dig på en kaffe på ett vis vis. Okay, so comma, uh, comma, pan uh, with the same. You can even sort of see it that it's it's the same uh, accent you're comfortable there. So this is our third uh, prosody syntax uh, mismatch. Two group, uh, two words uh, can be grouped into a single maximal prosodic word uh, uh, in the syntax. So it looks as if the prosodic word in Swedish will, uh, uh, you know, quite often mismatch with the uh, with the syntax. Okay, so so sort of summing up what we've I, I've said so far uh, is then that uh, accent assignment. So we have the uh, uh, culminativity by word accent up there and by stress syllable down here, and then the uh, assignment of accent. Uh, the lexical accent is assigned inside the minimal prosodic word, and uh, post-lexical accent is assigned uh, 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 in the maximal prosodic word writing. So one might ask, what makes this transition possible? Why would you take a phrase and turn it into a prosodic word uh, in the syntax? Uh, and so uh, we think that that might simply be the deal uh, 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 headedness uh, uh, thing. You know, so uh, that article verbs are in fact already minimal prosodic words, uh, but they have the head to the right, uh, and the argument would be that uh, so these are lexicalized phrases, Rödamattan, the red carpet. Uh, uh, these uh, these sequences contain only one uh, one uh, tonal pitch accent on mattan. That's the, what the uppercase letters mean. So röda is de-accented. And if you're de-accented, you can't be a maximal prosodic word under the logic of this uh, proposal, at least. So we assume that they are actually uh, a maximal prosodic word with the head to the right. And all you have to do is move the head to the left, and it will come out as a compound. That is, the, uh, that is sort of the, uh, the proposal then. And we call this the one-to-one uh, -one hypothesis. So for every accent, uh, accentual prominence correlates with maximal prosodic words. Uh, so it's a hypothesis, right? But it, it's what we uh, uh, guess. So it means that you should just, uh, whenever we hear uh, or see an accent, uh, uh, that should be uh, one maximal prosodic word. And all we have to do then would be to determine where the boundaries for that prosodic word. So this is when we find a maximal prosodic, uh, when we find a, an accent. When accent is absent, then, when the content word lacks an accent, uh, then we interpret that as uh, that content word being incorporated into a maximal word nearby, you know, when the head is nearby. So this would mean that the accenting is in fact incorporation, prosodic incorporation into uh, a maximal prosodic word. Uh, okay. So let's see what I'm going to, I think I'm going to uh, skip a little here. So these are uh, uh, lexicalized phrases. These are the ones that turn into compounds. I think I've just jumped this and look at the more... Uh, uh, I think I'm out of time here. Uh, okay, so I should, uh, I've already mentioned this case, but it's, it's number four in our prosody syntax mismatches. Two words can be grouped into a single maximal uh, prosodic word as a phrase. So these are the lexicalized phrases, Röda Korsas, or Röda Torjent, the red square. But there is a fifth uh, mismatch, uh, uh, and this time it's sort of the other way around. It's where you have a morphological uh, word which is prosodified as a prosodic phrase, so as two maximal uh, 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 forms. Okay, that's the wrong form here. So let, let's look at these. So these are the cases, um, uh, uh, you have some, okay, so you have these words that end in T or E in Swedish, objective, positive, negative, but well, you know, you have the same cognates in Russian. 
So they will typically, uh, in the basic form, they will have stress to the right. Objektiv, positiv, negativ, and they must have accent one. Some of them uh, make formal compounds in Swedish. So substantiv, infinitiv, objektiv. I'm exaggerating, but they get accent two, you can hear that. Mm -hmm. So they make maximal prosodic word with accent two. But then, there is what we could call a formal phrase, where you go objektiv, positiv, negativ, and these are typically in pairs, in contrasted pairs with, you know, so you'll have positive contrasting with negative. So the cool thing here is that you have uh, one uh, maximal prosodic word here, receiving accent one, and then you have another maximal prosodic word here, also receiving one. So they are receiving two accents, and that should mean uh, uh, that they are, uh, they are two maximal prosodic words, and hence they are a phrase rather than uh, uh, rather than a, uh, one word. So it's morphologically one word, but it's treated as a prosodic phrase. So it's kind of crazy. So uh, the way to, to uh, uh, so these forms, objective, positive, negative, sound the same way as real phrases do. Better live, better life. Personal archive, personal archive. So they have the same, they have the same uh, uh, melody. They, are, they look the same when you, uh, and they seem to be dependent on contrasted stress here. You get the same thing if you make, uh, so you have a word like capriful, uh, the flower, with final stress. If you make a contrasted uh, pronunciation of that. You will go kiprifu. Did, so did you say kiprifu? No, I said kaprifu. Uh, so when you contrast in the stress and unstressed syllable, you get the same type of prosody uh, with uh, phrasal prosody. So, uh, so uh, that's this contrast here. So I have like two minutes maybe, or one minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to. Uh, uh, wrap up. Okay, so. I'm going to say two words about the higher uh, prosodic structures and then I'll quit. So we have, uh, uh, I said that accents uh, uh, define the maximal prosodic word. Now to get the prosodic phrase and the intonation phrase, the two categories I haven't talked much about today, uh, the, the suggestion is that it's the big accent, the bigger type which defines uh, the prosodic phrase. So I said that there should be a there was a correlation between focus and big accent, but not between big accent and focus. Uh, and we'll listen to an example that shows this. So here we have uh, three big accents, one over here, one here, and one here. And this is the one which is focal, the other two are not. So now you can see that it's true. The hundra lamen på högre bortre ängen ska säljas. So hundra ängen and säljas. So this shows that uh, there are more big accents than there are uh, foci in a sentence. Uh, and the proposal then is that uh, big accent, whenever you have a big accent, you also have a, uh, a prosodic uh, phrase. Okay, I think I'm just not going to have time for this. So I'll just skip to the conclusion. So, uh, the depth of syntax uh, uh, versus the flatness of uh, prosody entail mismatches. Uh, there is some depth uh, to prosody we have seen. There is recursion. Uh, and we can see that it cues morphological structure in some cases, like with the prefix, uh, and that it may mismatch uh, quite a lot too with syntactic structure. So we have the de-accenting case, and we have this uh, grouping case with uh, with a prefix or the, the adverbial in the syntax and the, the compound structure here. And it also uh, uh, mismatches within word structure, right? So implicit or negative get to uh, phrases. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And we have now about uh, nine minutes for questions and discussion. So your questions, please. Yes, please. Yes, it's, yes. Uh, it, it may be a detail, but your uh, argument for syllabification of uh, words like uh, the difference between uh, the prefixes. Yes. Fur, fur, and what was the other one? Yes. 
uh, and uh, for example this yeah. at the other hand that they behave differently yeah and those are fur, for example and this synthesera this uh, yeah it's fine with me de sin de but sin. for ra is not good so for fur, you need to have a root that begins with a vowel right so, ah yes, uh, yeah. So for, 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 for that one can't be for ah. ra. ra. Um, actually, I would like to. You say intuitively. I accept uh, it. It is like that. But is there any way of measuring this uh, in uh, technically, uh, uh, acoustically? Uh, that maybe I'm not good enough a phonetician for that. I think if we are a little unlucky that the only only one of those two prefixes. Uh, has a consonant at the end and it happens to be R. You know, if it were a T uh, yes. or an S, it would be great. Then I think you would be able to measure it. I think the way to go is to um, uh, collect people's intuitions and try to make you know more than mine. Uh, I've asked, obviously asked a few people, but I haven't made the real experiment. Uh -huh. But it's a sort of, it's not it's a little tricky because you have to uh, you have to sort of slow down and you have to retain your intuitions. It's kind of a I'm not going to say it's a quiet skill, but it it, it requires uh, it's not a simple experiment to make. To, to ask people exactly, their exactly because uh, if you uh, if you ask ordinary people yeah. about how they yeah. would uh, yeah. would, uh, would, would, uh, would make the syllables and that word uh, they would probably mm -hmm. not have no background for ask answering. They would no. not be aware of how they are using. No the right. Language. Yeah. So probably it's, it's it's probably still worth trying to do the the uh, uh, measuring part. Yeah. But I think you would like to measure something in slow speed, in slow yeah. speech, right? Uh, yeah. As if if you can somehow make it formal. Uh, mm. But you're right. There is an experiment to be done there that that I haven't done. That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. More questions? I feel quite confused with your terminology concerning lexical versus post-lexical. Okay. Um, tell me, Simon, because you, if you take uh, lexical affixes, some of them are derivative, some of them are inflectional, yes. which means that they are only typical for some word forms. So why are they actually lexical? And on the other hand, if you take post-lexical um, post prefixes, they are derivative. So why are they post-lexical? Okay, uh, I'm not. Uh, 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 I actually don't make any assumptions for the morphemes as such as being lexical or post-lexical, but rather the uh, uh, accent assignment procedure as being lexical or post-lexical. So meaning that uh, uh, you know these are all lexical elements with their own uh, properties, but le accent assignment. Uh, uh, will only take place. Um, uh, okay, so lexical accent assignment is the assignment of a <coughs> tone from uh, a, a lexically specified tone in a suffix. Right. So you have the suffix comes with the tone, and uh, so that's sort of the lexical tone because it's memorized, memorized, right? But so then it's you lexical have for the suffix. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, it's yeah, it's memorized with a, it's a phoneme in the in the suffix, right? So if the suffix is ig, there's an e, a g, and a high tone in my dialect. But, so those three things are memorized. It's lexical in that way. It's memorized. Now, for that to be assigned, uh, uh, you know, be expressed uh, on the surface, it has to be assigned inside the minimal prosodic word, right? So, and only if that remains, the minimal prosodic word also becomes the maximal, you know, whatever comes out of your mouth, then you're going to hear that accent too. But if it's in a compound, then nobody sees the lexical information anymore. You just look at the stresses, and that's the post-lexical accent too, right? So what you get in compounds. Uh, so what, why can't you say that um, stress accent one is lexical for, for the prefix? But that has been proposed, uh, not by me. But uh, that has, has been proposed. But, uh, so the problem with accent one is that it's, uh, when you look at the structure, it's uh, uh, it's a subset of accent two. Accent two is the, you know, melodically, accent two contains one extra tone, whereas accent one one seems to be nothing. You know, accent one is is no phonological object. It's just prominence. So accent one is always post-lexical. Uh, 
Axon 1 is just that you know, pitch prominence. Axon 2 is that pitch prominence plus either a lexical tone or a post-lexical tone in the case of compounds. This is tricky to, you know, to, to separate, uh, but, it, uh, but that's the deal, right? So whenever lexical accent assignment is inhibited or not visible, then you get the, the post-lexical uh, procedures. If there's one stress, you get accent 1. If there are two stresses, you get accent 2. So that's, that's the deal. We have time for one more question. I thought maybe you'll say uh, something uh, about how your accents uh, correlate to, uh, say, um, some patterns or um, discourse uh, prosody. I mean, say, topic uh, prosody or incompleteness, discourse incompleteness prosody. Um. Okay. Contrast. So, um, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm not, um, the thing I would say is that, so accent, uh, you get many more accents uh, expressed in, uh, in, uh, in, in Swedish compared to English, for instance, right? So, of course, in focus, uh, you know, the typical domains, you, you get the big accent, uh, the big, uh, but also outside of focus, you will get the smaller one, the, the small accents. And they will occur, uh, uh, they will occur on pretty much all content words outside of focus. Let's see, would that be what you'd... Uh, um, that, because that's sort of an international question you're asking, right? What is the international... Uh, so the expression for, for uh, accent is much more frequent in... in uh, uh, it's really... The way we think of it, of it now is that it's really... It's easier to say when accent is being uh, de-accented. You know, look for the context where you don't get an accent for a content word, uh, rather than saying where you actually realize accents. The normal thing is for every content word to have an accent, even outside of the focus. Um, I don't know, is that half an answer to your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we shall thank you once again. Thank you very much.